How is money created? Where does it come from? Who benefits? And what purpose does it serve? The money system. What is the money behind the money system? For centuries, the mechanics of the monetary system have remained hidden from the prying eyes of the populace. Yet its impact, both on a national and international level, is perhaps unsurpassed. For it is the monetary system that provides the foundations for international dominance and national control. Today, as these very foundations are being shaken by crises, the need for open and honest dialogue on the future of the monetary system has never been greater. This economic crisis is like a cancer. If you just wait and wait thinking this is going to go away, just like a cancer is going to grow and it's going to be too late. What I would say to everybody is get prepared. Uh, this is not a time right now to uh, wishful thinking the government is going to sort things out. The governments don't rule the world. Goldman Sachs rules the world. We're on the verge of a perfect storm. In opposition lie corrupt and entrenched interests that lurk in the corridors of power, for whom there are no reasons to relinquish privileges they feel are justly deserved. Has he got, has he got a reform plan for the NHS? No. Has he got a police reform plan? Has he got a plan to cut the deficit? Do you trust the government? Order. Try to calm down and behave like an adult. And if you can't, if it's beyond you, leave the chamber, get out, we'll manage without you. This is the Banksy Station. There's no coincidence that Boom and Bust started to become a real cyclical issue around about the 1700s um, when William Patterson founded the Bank of England. This is intolerable behaviour as far as the public... No, it's not funny. <laughs> Only in your mind is it funny. It's not funny at all. It's disgraceful. The system is inherently unstable as a result of the international power it provides to the dominant parties. For at the heart of it lies the idea of how can I get something for nothing? Statistical analysis has found that every time an empire begins to near its own demise, you'll find that its currency will be debased. There is no guide to how this whole system operates. Uh, to give you an example, a researcher at the BBC working on a Robert Peston documentary went to the Bank of England and said, can you give me a, you know, a, a guide to how money is created? And they just said, no. This documentary will investigate and explain this ever-changing system and the impact it has, both on a national and international level. In 2010, the total UK money supply stood at £2.15 trillion. 2.6% of this total was physical cash, £53.5 billion. The rest, £2.1 trillion, or 97.4% of the total money supply, was commercial bank money. The 3% of money um, is created uh, through the central bank and that money essentially, if you created a £10 note, you could sell that to a bank to put into their ATM and the bank would have to repay that £10 or buy it for £10. There'd be no interest may, uh, charged on that money, but that money is then essentially transferred to the Treasury and it's a, it's a, it's a form of fundraising um, for the government. It's called Sinaraj.
when the Bank of England creates a £10 note, it costed about three or four pence to actually print that note. And it sells it to the high street banks at face value, so at £10. And the profit, the difference between printing the note and actually selling it for £10, goes directly to the treasury. So in effect, all the profit that we get on creating physical money, uh, banknotes, goes to the treasury. And it reduces how much taxes we have to pay. Um, over the last 10 years, that's raised about £18 billion. In 1948, notes and coins constituted 17% of the total money supply. This was one contributing factor in the government's ability to finance post-war reconstruction. This included the establishment of the NHS. In only 60 years, notes and coins have shrunk to less than 3%. Prior to 1844, bank notes were created by private banks and the government did not profit from their creation. Pre-industrialisation, there was multiple forms of money coexisting. And so the kind of rise of, kind of, of government-sponsored fiat money is a relatively recent um, phenomenon. In the 1840s, there was no law to stop banks from creating their own bank notes. So they used to issue um, paper notes as, as kind of a, a representative of what you had in the bank account. Instead of you taking your heavy metal coins out of the bank and then going and paying somebody with them, you could get your paper which said how much money you had in the bank and you could give that to somebody and they could use that to go and get the heavy metal coins from the bank. Now over time these paper notes became as good as money. People would use the paper notes instead of going and getting the real money from the bank. And obviously as soon as the banks realised that what they were creating had become you know, the dominant type of money in the economy, they realized that by, by creating more of it, they could generate profits. You know, they can just print up some new notes, lend it, and get the interest on top of that. And they did that you know, up until the 1840s. In the 1840s, they pushed it just a little bit too far, and that caused inflation, it destabilized the economy. So in 1844, the conservative government of Robert Peel actually passed a law that took the power to create money away from the commercial banks um, and brought it back to the state. So since then, the Bank of England has been the only organisation authorised to, to create paper notes. Since then, everything's gone digital. And what we now use as money is the digital numbers that commercial banks can create out of nothing. The problem was that they did not include in that, in that legislation um, the deposits, the demand deposits um, held in banks by individuals or um, electronic forms of money which essentially what those demand deposits are today. <clears throat> Most of the money in circulation is, is electronic money um, and it's bank, it's bank um, demand deposits um, that just that, that sit in our, in our account. So in a way the legislation has got needs to catch up with developments in, in, in electronic money uh, uh, and the way that banks actually operate. Money held in bank accounts are called demand deposits. This is an accounting term the banks use when they create credit. Banks follow the same process when they create loans. All money held in bank accounts is an accounting entry. The reality is now that most money is not paper and it's not metal coins, it's digital. It's just numbers in a computer system, you know, it's your Visa debit card, it's your electronic, you know, ATM card. Um, it's this, it's plastic, you know, it's numbers in a computer system. You move money from one computer system to another, it's all a big database. And this digital money is what we're now using to make payments with, it's what we actually use to run the economy. I think a lot of people in the UK probably think that the government or the central bank um, is, is in control of most, most money in circulation and issues new money into circulation, but that's uh, not the case. It's private banks that create the vast majority of new money in circulation and also decide uh, how it's allocated. 
The official terminology for this accounting entry is commercial bank money. When banks issue loans to the public, they create new commercial bank money. When a customer repays a loan, commercial bank money is destroyed. The banks keep the interest as profit. There's a lot of misconceptions about the way banks work. There was a, a poll done by the Cobden Centre where they asked people you know, how, how they thought banks actually operated. Around 30% of the public think that when you put your money into the bank, it just stays there and it's safe. And you can understand why, because you know, every, every child has a piggy bank where you keep putting money in, and then when it's a rainy day, you smash it and you take that money out and you spend it. So a lot of people f keep this, this idea of banking, you know, it's somewhere safe to keep your money so that it's there for whenever you need it. Um, another, the other 60% of people assume that when you put your money in, that money's then being moved across to somebody who wants to borrow it. So you have a pensioner who keeps saving money her entire life, and then her life savings have been lent to some you know, young people who want to buy a house. But actually, banks don't work like that. At the moment in the UK, money creation uh, and control is, is largely in the hands of private banks. Uh, about 97 to 98% of money um, that's, that's created is, is created um, as bank, bank debt money, you could call it, um, when banks issue money into circulation as, as loans, essentially. Um, this is a very poorly understood fact. It's not a conspiracy theory, it's not a... Um it's not a crackpot theory, it's the way the Bank of England describes the process. When banks make loans, they create new money. A few economists will realise the way the money system works, but if you don't, if you don't realise the way that money works, then you think that you know, everybody saving is going to work well for the economy. What really happens, once you understand the way the money system works, is that if everybody starts saving, uh, the amount of money in the economy shrinks and we have a recession. So most economists don't have this, this full picture. They don't understand all elements of the system. They rely on uh, assumptions, on, you know, received knowledge, without actually going into the details. And you know, money is, money is the centre of the economy. If you don't understand where it comes from, who, it creates, who creates it, and when it gets created, then how can you understand the entire economy? When the vast majority of money that we use now is not cash, but it's electronic money, then whoever's creating the electronic money is getting the proceeds of creating that money. And obviously, creating electronic money is much more profitable than creating cash, because you don't have any production costs at all. So while we've got 18 billion over the course of a decade in profit from creating cash, the banks have actually created 1.2 trillion pounds. Between 1998 and 2007, the UK money supply tripled. 1.2 trillion pounds was created by banks, whilst 18 billion pounds was created by the Treasury. A lot of people think when I say this, or when you say this, or when Positive Money say this, that we're all just a bunch of nutters. But on the 9th of March in 2009, the Governor of the Federal Reserve, um, Ben Bernanke, gave the first ever broadcast interview the Governor of the Central Bank of the United States of America had ever given. And uh, the day before that, he'd bailed out AIG, um, uh, which is an insurance company, not even a bank, actually, to the tune of about $160 billion. So the journalist says to him, now, Mr. Bernanke, where did you get $160 billion to bail out AIG? Is that tax money that the Fed is spending? It's not tax money. The banks have um, accounts with the Fed much the same way that you have an account in a commercial bank. So to lend to a bank, we simply use the computer to mark up the uh, size of the account that they have with the Fed. So it's much more akin, uh, although not exactly the same, but it's much more akin to printing money than it is to borrowing. 
banks create new money whenever they extend credit, buy existing assets or make payments on their own account, which mostly involves expanding their assets. When a bank buys securities, such as a corporate or government bond, it adds the bond to its assets and increases the company's bank deposits by the corresponding amount. New commercial bank money enters circulation when people spend the credit that has been granted to them by banks. I found that talking on the doorstep from August last year round to no, August 2009 round to the general election, what, eight, nine, eight, nine months, I suppose, knocking on doors, is that when you try to explain how the money system works, there's uh, an almost inbuilt refusal of people to accept that such a bizarre situation could actually uh, exist. No, it can't possibly, you know. What do you mean? You can't, bank, banks can't, the banks don't create money out of thin air. That's ridiculous, they can't do that. They lend out their depositors money. Most people have an idea of, of how money is. They're used to their own way of handling money. Uh, and they try and implement their own idea of how, how their small household economy works into the national economy. And of course, it just doesn't work out. It just doesn't work out at all. By 2008, the outstanding loan portfolio of bank-created credit, also known as commercial bank money, stood at over £2 trillion. As recently as 1982, the ratio of notes and coins to bank deposits was 1 to 12. By 2010, the ratio had risen to 1 to 37. That is, for every pound of Treasury-created money, there was £37 pounds of bank-created money. In the 10 years prior to the 2007 crisis, the UK commercial bank money supply expanded by between 7 to 10% every year. A growth rate of 7% is the equivalent of doubling the money supply every 10 years. The amount of money they're creating out of nothing is just incredible. 1.2 trillion in the last 10 years. Um, and there's, that money has been distributed according to the priorities of the banking sector. You know, not the priorities of society. Bank sector itself grew from 1980 $2.5 trillion to $40 trillion by assets. In 1980, global bank assets were worth 20 times the then global economy. By 2006, they were worth 75 times, according to the UN. As the following chart shows, total bank assets of UK banks as a percentage of GDP remain relatively stable at 50 to 60% up to the end of the 1960s. After that, they shot up dramatically. And the real money in, in the world uh, to be made today is not by producing anything at all, it's simply by forms of speculating, basically making money from money. Uh, that's the most profitable and, and by far and away um, the, the biggest form of, of, of activity, of economic activity that exists in the world today. Today, banks are no longer restricted by how much they can lend and as such, how much new credit they can create out of nothing. They are restricted solely by their own willingness to lend. The issue with allowing banks to create money, uh, there's two main issues. Firstly, the fact that they create this money when they make loans. So it guarantees that you know, we have to borrow all our money for the economy from the banks. As such, to have a healthy growing economy, the government needs to put in place strategies to allow for ever-increasing debt. The only way the government can create additional purchasing power is by getting itself and us into more debt. The second big issue with allowing banks to create money is that they have the incentive to always create more. You know, they create more money if they issue a loan. They get the bonuses and the commissions and the incentives to create, you know, to lend as much as possible. You have to develop a sales culture. What did they do? They recruited an amazing guy, lovely guy, Andy Hornby, who came from ASDA, to turn the bank into a supermarket retailing operation. If you trust bankers to control the money supply, the money supply will just grow and grow and grow, as will the level of debt. 
until the point where it crashes, you know, when some people can't repay the debt. And then they'll stop lending. You hear politicians and journalists saying, you know, we've, we've been living beyond our means, we've become dependent on debt, we need to rein in our spending and live within our means. Um, it's not possible in the current system. You know, the reason why everybody's in debt now is not because they've been recklessly borrowing. Um, we haven't borrowed all this money from, you know, an army of pensioners who've been saving up their whole, whole lives. Money in the current system is debt. You know, it's created when banks make loans. So the only way in the current system that we can have any money in the economy, you know, the only way we can have money for business to trade is if we've borrowed it all from the banks. And it's the very opposite of what the Tory party is arguing today, which is that you have to create savings before you can help the National Health Service. And it's because economists have completely confused those things, both in monetary policy terms, but also in economic thinking, and because most people still harbour the, the old-fashioned view that you need savings before you can invest, that we have the mess that we're in today. Now, one of the reasons why we find it difficult to understand the banking system and credit creation is that we leave school without any money and we go and get a job working as an apprentice to a plumber. We work really hard all month and at the end of the month somebody puts money in our bank and so for us the logic is you work and then you get money, you get savings. In reality you would never have got that job if credit hadn't been created in the first instance. It's a really important um, conceptual misunderstanding and it isn't something that the public just are guilty of. Economists don't understand this stuff. Money doesn't come out of economic activity. A lot of people I've come across as kind of assume that if you've got people, if you've got businesses and you've got people doing things, that somehow money somehow emerges out of the process of people doing things, doing economic, making things and growing things and selling things and producing things, that somehow money just emerges it's not, it's like oil in the car, you have to put it in. When I see David Cameron talking about how um, we need an economy not based on debt, but we need an economy based on savings, it, he just doesn't know what he's saying. It's ridiculous, it's absolutely absurd, and it shows his complete lack of understanding of how our money system actually works. What he's essentially saying is that we need an economy with no money. If everyone was saving, we'd have mass disappearing of money, which is essentially what a bank write-off is, essentially, is people defaulting on their debt, which, which essentially is just money disappearing. But if people weren't taking on the debt, then it's just, it's just such a joke, it's such an amateur understanding of how our economy works and how the monetary system works and how money is actually created. So um, I really do get a laugh out of watching what people are actually saying, and they're all just regurgitating what they've learned off each other and you just hear the same things and it just makes me it, it really gets on my nerves when I hear people talking about um, yeah we need more regulations we need to regulate the way banks are actually and the bonus it's all just one big smoke screen and working on all the symptoms of a greater disease which is really you need to look at the the money system the way money is created and uh, if we don't want any debt, then we're essentially saying we don't want any money and we want a moneyless economy with the exception of the 3% that's created debt free. You know, it's a paradox under the current system. If, you, if we as the public go into further debt, then that's going to put more money into the economy and we're going to have a boom. When you have a boom, it's easier to borrow so people get into even more debt. And eventually, you know, this, this cycle continues, it gets easier and easier to get into debt until some people get over in debt and then, you know, they default. They can't repay their mortgage. That's what happened in, you know, it happened first in subprime America. Um, and then, you know, that just brings through a wave of defaults which will ripple across the entire economy. The banks go insolvent, then we're into a financial crisis. Um, and then the banks stop lending. And, you know, the, they were excessively lending in the boom and then they stop lending and then that co makes the recession even worse. People lose their jobs and then they become even more dependent on debt just to survive, basically. You know, we have a, a system where we have to borrow in order to have an economy. We have to be in debt to the banks. And that, that guarantees, you know, a massive profit for the banks. This is the boom-bust cycle. 
I have said before, Mr. Deputy Speaker, no return to boom and bust. Net bank lending must forever increase. We're paying interest on every single pound, even if, even if you think the money belongs to you. Somebody somewhere is paying interest on that money. The banking system has such a huge impact on the world, but only because it supplies our nation's money supply. We have to protect them, we have to subsidise them, we have to allow them to continue because the, the disaster of, of a, a bank collapse affects us all in a huge way. And anyone that says that we shouldn't have bailed out the banks doesn't quite understand the, the, the nature of our monetary system. That's like eliminating a, a huge chunk of our money. But also, bailing out the banks is perpetuating a system which is never going to work anyway. So whatever we do, we're always going to have this cycle until we separate how money is created and the activities of banking. Then the banks can do as they wish. They're a normal business like everyone else. There's a, a major democratic issue here as well. I mean, you have these private profit-seeking banks creating up to 200 billion pounds a year and pumping that into the economy wherever they want, basically, wherever it suits them. Whether they're pumping it into you know, these toxic deri derivatives or putting money into housing bubbles, just making housing more expensive. 200 billion pounds in 2007 of new money coming into the economy created out of nothing. And where that gets spent determines you know, the shape of our economy, effectively. So if we're going to allow anybody to create new money out of nothing, then we should at least have some democratic control over how that money is used. I mean, it, it, would we rather have had that money used for healthcare, you know, to deal with some of the environmental issues, to reduce poverty, or would we rather have it to make houses more expensive so that none of us can afford to, to live in a house? You can see it as a subsidy, a special super subsidy to the banks for the right to create money which should be for the benefit of the public and spent through a democratic process. There's also another form of money which is effectively an electronic version of cash and it's a type of money that the commercial banks use themselves to make payments between each other. The high street banks don't want to be carrying around huge quantities of money because it's dangerous and it's inconvenient and it's you know, expensive. You have to hire security guards for that type of money. So what they do is they pay each other in what is an electronic version of cash, um, which in the industry is known as central bank reserves. Um, they keep this electronic cash in accounts at the Bank of England. But as a member of the public, you can't access this electronic cash. You can't get it, an account with the Bank of England. What they do is they, they effectively sell this central bank money to the banks. And they do this by creating it out of nothing and using this money to pay for bonds, to buy bonds from the high street banks. So the high street bank will come along with a bond, which is you know, effectively government debt and it will give it to the Bank of England and in return the Bank of England will type some new numbers into the bank's account at the Bank of England. So effectively they're creating central bank reserves out of nothing. The Bank of England creates central bank reserves by increasing the available credit in the settlement bank's account with the Bank of England. The settlement bank in return posts bonds or sells assets as collateral for the reserves. A total of 46 banks hold central reserve accounts at the Bank of England. Smaller or foreign banks hold accounts with one of these 46 banks to allow them to accept or make payments in pounds sterling. Prior to March 2009, the Bank of England would ask each of the major settlement banks how much reserve currency they needed. The settlement banks would then swap a bond for the reserve currency and agree to repurchase the bond for a specific amount at a specified future date. The settlement banks would then receive interest at base or policy rate for the central bank reserves they held. Since the crisis, settlement bank central reserves have shot up dramatically.
when bank customers transfer funds from their account to another person's account. A process called intraday clearing occurs. The amount of central reserve currency Bank A has at the Bank of England is reduced by the corresponding amount that Bank B receives. This is the importance of central reserve currency to banks. Before the credit crisis, if a bank was short of central reserves at the Bank of England to meet its obligations, then the bank would have to loan reserves from other banks with interest. If you sell something on eBay, you know that that deal's not complete until you get some money put into your account. You know, most people actually want to see the money in their account before they're happy to close on a deal. Now, the banks are pretty much the same, but they want to see the money in their account at the Bank of England before they consider a deal complete. So, for example, if, you, if you're buying a house from somebody who banks with a different bank, then what, what will happen after you spend a quarter of a million on a house is you'll tell your bank to transfer some money to the house seller's bank. And what the bank will do is actually instruct the Bank of England to move 250,000 from their account at the Bank of England to the bank of the house seller. And that money will actually move across between the accounts at the Bank of England. Um, when that money is moved across, then the banks will consider that that payment has been made, you know, it's been settled. Um, they don't really deal in the kind of money that we have in our accounts, they deal in this special money that can only be used at the central bank. There are millions of people across the country all transferring money to each other using only a few major banks. These banks can keep a tally on their computer systems and usually many of the movements cancel each other out at the end of the day. The five major banks, RBS, Lloyds, HSBC, Barclays and Santander hold over 85% of all deposits. As there are a limited number of banks in the system, the central reserve money can only be moved around them in a closed loop. The money is just circulating through the system over and over again. And if you think about it, a one pound coin could be used to make a billion pounds of payments if it was circulated a billion times. And that's effectively the system that you have now, is you have a small pool of real money that's just going round and round the system, and it's been used to make a, a huge quantity of payments on our behalf. Just before the crisis, there was only £20 billion in the accounts at the central bank. If they don't have enough of this central bank money, then effectively they can't make payments. And if that happens, then pretty quickly the entire system seizes up. So the Bank of England has the responsibility of making sure there's enough of this money in the system. The requirements for banks to hold a specific amount of reserves has changed many times since 1947. At that time, banks needed to hold a minimum ratio of 32% of reserves, cash or treasury bonds to deposits. In 2006, the corridor system was introduced in which banks could set their own reserve targets each month. The rules changed again in March 2009, when the Bank of England introduced quantitative easing. Quantitative easing, in effect, gives settlement banks the central reserve currency for free. The central reserve currency is what is referred to as the real money in the fractional reserve model. But the fact is, banks can have as much of this as they want. And central reserve currency itself is a form of fiat money, which is backed by nothing. As a consequence, there is no longer a meaningful fractional reserve. If you look over the history, the last 150 years or so, you, you start off um, with the development of, a, of a, a gold standard that really comes to the fore in the 1880s, 1890s, where essentially uh, 
countries peg themselves to a particular defined value of gold and then they have an agreement to uh, fix that value, to hold that value and to trade gold amongst themselves to, to make sure the balances are all there and also to try and uh, restrict or expand or contract um, activity in their own economies uh, to make sure that the balance, that particular fixed price is, is maintained. That disintegrates uh, in the, well, after the First World War. I mean, this is where the whole thing breaks apart. Very major dislocation in the international monetary system at that point. Not really resolved until you get Bretton Woods agreements at the end of the Second World War, in which everything is pegged to the dollar and the dollar is pegged to the gold. So you're kind of one remove from uh, gold backing or saying that there is a definite, you know, sort of solid commodity money behind the paper money and the credit money that we're all using over here. You're kind of one remove from it. After Hiroshima, Tokyo wondered when the next atom bomb would fall. They did not wonder long. In 1944, at Bretton Woods, the US and the UK began to negotiate how to govern the world economy, the world monetary system, and came up with the World Bank and the IMF and a series of other institutions designed to manage the global currency. And there was still a gold standard, but this gold standard was going to be tied to the dollar. All of the world's gold had moved from London to Fort Knox and all of the world's currencies were tied to the dollar. This system was designed to manage the sorts of imbalances to avoid credit crunches or for countries, credit crunches are known as balance of trades deficits, i.e. when they can't pay their bills and their currency collapses. The currencies were managed and the system was stable as long as the Americans played the role of oversight. Now, who knows the great story about how that all came to an end? So the quantity of money that was needed to pay for the Vietnam War, that's exactly what I was trying to get at. Oil shocks was another one. That meant that the Americans were no longer respecting their role or playing their role governing the monetary system. They were inflating the value of their own currency, but ostensibly it was meant to be tied, tied to gold and to every other currency. So what did the French do? The French were a little bit worried that President Nixon wasn't entirely honest. And they were worried that they were, that precisely what we described, that Nixon was printing money when he shouldn't have been, was going on. And they were worried there wasn't enough gold to honor the exchange rate of the French franc. So they sent a gunboat to New York Harbor to ever so politely ask for our gold back, please. Did they get their gold back? <laughs> Go on, guess. They didn't. And the Bretton Woods system came to an end. And this is the point in which we enter the modern era of the financial system. Historically, money creation was pegged to a commodity, often gold, but today, it is pegged to nothing. Which means there is nothing backing our money. This piece of paper is just a piece of paper. Where does this leave us? If money is based on nothing, why do we think it has any value? <laughs> Sorry? Because we can still go and exchange it. What? Well, somebody else is going to shout. Great little Latin fact, the word for credit comes from? <laughs> Belief. Correct. Since the collapse of the dollar gold standard in 1971 and the deregulation of the financial system, money creation has grown exponentially. The World Economic Forum meeting in, in Davos at the present time have called on a need for the credit within the economy, uh, the global economy, to be expanded by 100 trillion dollars, 100 trillion US dollars. Uh, a trillion is 12 noughts, so 100 trillion, if you want to imagine, is a one followed by 14 noughts. They believe this credit expansion will create a boom, 
because there is now more money in the economy with which to make investments. It's fascinating that this, the emergence of digital currencies, how it's transformed everything really, um, because it just completely unleashed private banks to dominate and create the money system that works for them and works for the people who run private banks. If we want a growing economy, under the current setup, we have to have growing debt. You can't, you know, this is something that very, very few people really understand, especially not the politicians who are managing the economy, which is a, a scary thought. As the money supply grows, more money is available, which can be invested in productive avenues. However, it can also be used to gamble and drive up asset prices. Inflation is a rise in the general level of prices of goods and services in an economy over a period of time. When the general price level rises, each unit of currency buys fewer goods and services. As the money supply grows and there is more currency available, more money is available for investment, which can lead to growth. But more money is also available for purchases of goods and speculation, which leads to inflation. Essentially, inflation is what happens when too much money is chasing too few goods and services. So the, the, there's too much money for the, the actual output of the economy. In the seven years between 2000 and 2007, the money supply doubled. And the banks, you know, the central bank, the Bank of England in this time, was under the impression that they had it under control because they were saying, you know, prices aren't going up that much. Of course, they were only looking at prices in, you know, in your local cor corner shop. They weren't looking at the price of housing, and housing is, you know, the biggest expenditure that most people will make. Increasing house prices, uh, it may may make you feel like you're you're becoming wealthier, but as your wealth increases, the effect is that your children's wealth is actually decreasing. So in fact, there's no net gain in wealth because your children are going to have to pay even more when they want to buy a house. So in, in effect, there's no, there's no kind of net increase. They're gonna to have to earn even more. They're gonna to have to go into even more debt. So the rising house prices do not create additional uh, net GDP value to the economy. It, it, they, they, actually what they do is they redistribute wealth uh, towards those people who already have houses, i.e. wealthier people, and remove it from poorer people who can't afford to get on the housing ladder. So it's another example of a very regressive policy actually to allow house prices to simply inflate. Uh, it makes everybody feel kind of like things are going well, uh, uh, and people spend more money on other stuff, they take equity out of their houses, but it, it's not creating new jobs, it's not uh, in, enhancing the quality of the economy, it's not helping our balance of trade, it's not helping the public deficit, um, it's a, it's a zero-sum game. As of August 2011, 85.5% of consumer bank lending was secured as mortgages on dwellings, if you have somebody creating money that can only be spent on one thing, which is housing, then the price of that thing is going to go up. Between 2000 and 2010, they created over a trillion pounds of new money, 500 billion pounds just in the three years before the crisis. That's why house prices went up the way they were. There's nothing you know, special about houses, it was just all this funny money being pumped into that market. If money is spent into the economy, into, into a lot of money goes into houses, for example, into mortgages, um, that's an increase in the amount of money in the economy without a corresponding increase in activity, in output, in GDP. It's non-GDP based um, spending. Uh, that's what causes inflation and, and, and in the UK we've, we've had it in spades 
we've had you know this massive uh, housing boom and that the main cause for the housing boom in my opinion is the huge amount of speculative credit created by the banks to go into houses if houses were cheaper um, they would be easier to build more there be more of them would be built there would be less huge houses with hardly any people in them london would not be the center of a, a kind of very rich um, speculative orgy where, where all the richest people in the world want, want to get a property in London because it's seen as a, as a great asset. You know, houses would be seen as places to live primarily rather than places to invest. Important thing to think about is if you're a bank and you've got to make a loan, you have choices. You can, you can give that loan to um, a small business and you'll know that the risk to you of that loan failing, defaulting, is actually quite high because that small business, the owners of that business, have limited liability, which means if the business goes bust, you as a bank are getting nothing back, essentially. You know, that, that's it. So that's kind of high risk compared to loaning your money to somebody with some collateral, with a house behind them, like a mortgage. So there's a, there's a kind of simple incentive for banks to prefer putting money into housing than into a, a small business. Now that's a real problem or if you, if, you, if you widen that out across a whole economy because it means there's an incentive you know, to put money into speculative rather than productive investments. So again, we have to think about how we create a monetary system that is more balanced between those two kinds of speculative and productive investment. The government showing very little uh, enormous reluctance to regulate the housing market and to again regulate the amount of money that that banks put into houses. We don't decide who creates credit for what. No, we leave that to a couple of chaps in a bank to decide, basically. A bubble occurs when there is very high inflation in the price of a specific good or service over a short period of time. The idea of the tulips and their relevance is that we saw the first ever financial bubble and crash. The craze for tulips, black tulips being a mythical ideal of what somebody could genetically engineer through cultivation after many generations, became a mania in the Netherlands in the 1630s. What they didn't realize was that many of the very, very rare patterns on tulips were caused by a virus and weren't genetic at all. But they traded in them to the extent that tulip bulbs got to the point where they were worth 10 times the average annual salary of a person working in the Netherlands. There was a futures market in tulip bulbs because obviously you plant them now but you don't know what's going to come out of the ground. So we see already 400 years ago that a money system or a financial system is not something that exists in the abstract somewhere out there in the ether but something that was to do with states, power, trade, and how they interact with each other. Unlike tulips, which are a disposable luxury, houses are both a necessity and a luxury. And as such, they are ideal as a vehicle for money and bubble creation. A dwelling is perhaps the most prized possession of value most people aspire to. Inflating house prices in this way allows a nation to expand its money supply without affecting inflation data. The additional purchasing power created increases the perceived wealth in relation to other nations and thus it creates relative power. It is a way of increasing monetary power without investing in the productive growth of industry. But certainly if you look at Britain and America as outstanding examples of this, these are countries with very high rates of private home ownership, so you've got a good base to try and perform this sort of policy off the back of. I think it was quite deliberate in the case of the US, almost explicit. There's Alan Greenspan, as head of the Federal Reserve. When confronted by a stock market crash at the end of the, the 1990s, quite deliberately slashed interest rates to almost zero. Everyone can borrow. Uh, very, very cheaply. In particular, it's very easy to borrow against a house because this is an asset and it's potentially something that a bank can say, well, okay, we're not just lending you money 
unsecured, you actually do have a house, and that's great because you know, we can repossess it. They won't tell you this when you take the mortgage, but they, they can do this. And that bubble is then what fuels expansion, such as it is inside the US and inside the UK, where something similar takes place for, for the next decade or so. I think it's also a reflection of an underlying weakness of these governments, that they, they simply lack the will and possibly the ability, but I think it more comes down to a will to challenge financial markets, to challenge big capital and say, we're going to do something different now and you're going to have to go along with it because we've been democratically elected and you lot frankly haven't and we have a mandate to do this and we're going to make this happen. Just remember it's all part of the plan. What are you yapping about? You voted for it. In Holland or in the Netherlands, what we had over a period of trying to get independence initially from Spain and trying to raise money to get an army to free themselves was financial innovation. They innovated public lotteries to get money together. They had public subscription. This was the idea that led to the idea of public shares, a piece of the action that anybody could invest in. That meant that something like two thirds of the population was investing in tulip bulbs by the 1630s. After independence, these these instruments were applied to financing expansion. Why was such a small country able to hold its own against so much bigger countries, for example, Spain and Portugal, that had the benefits of their empires for over a century in respect of the Netherlands? Why could they compete? On what resource basis? Well, they had a more efficient, a more involved, and a broader-based financial system with these instruments that they'd innovated that allowed them to bring more money to bear at one point than anybody else more quickly. Incredible, but true. Now, inflation can be avoided if the amount of money that goes into the economy um, is regulated in a way that it doesn't exceed the actual activity that's happening in the economy. Now, the best way to do that, in my opinion, is to make sure that money is issued into the economy only for productive investment, for productive goods and services. So money goes in to help a small business start up, which creates jobs, which creates additional purchasing power, um, which means there's, n there's no inflation. During their history, almost all central banks have employed forms of direct credit regulation. The central bank would determine desired nominal GDP growth, then calculate the necessary amount of credit creation to achieve this, and then allocate this credit creation both across the various banks and type of banks and across industrial sectors. Unproductive credit was suppressed. Thus, it was difficult or impossible to obtain bank credit for large-scale, purely speculative transactions, such as today's large-scale bank funding, to hedge funds. The World Bank recognised in a 1993 study that this mechanism of intervention in credit allocation was at the core of the East Asian economic miracle. There's all sorts of things that governments have done in the past. Uh, very successfully in, in a number of cases, and, and not, often not unsuccessfully in this country, but you know, the examples that spring to mind like South Korea, Japan, often in East Asia where governments have been quite targeted about how they're going to rebalance the economy and picking sectors and deciding where the investment should take place. I think that has to start happening in the UK because we're in a, a demand side recession rather than looking at a crisis of, of supply. You, you have to have a system where credit is put into productive um, avenues where credit is put into building high-speed rail links, where credit is put into um, building houses rather than giving people money to inflate the price of, of houses. So it's, it's quite simple really in that way um, and uh, the current system is simply set up not to do that basically. The creation of money by private banks for non-productive usage causes real inflation and as such, it is a tax on the purchasing power of the medium of exchange. The figures for the UK are, are quite stark, actually. That average, medium, real incomes 
for so that's you know what the bit in the middle uh, for most people declined over the last eight years or so they're now in quite sharp decline as, as we go into the recession I mean the sharpest really since it looks like since about the 1930s put it that way so real incomes are declining bank created fiat currency allows the private banks to suck wealth from the economy and over time results in a gradual decrease in the standard of living as people become poorer they become even more dependent on debt. And this at a time when efficiency and machination have improved dramatically. If you know, you go back to the 1960s and we were expected to, to we were looking forward to a, a, an age of leisure. What would people, what they were talking, television programs saying, what's people going to do with all their spare time? You know, and now we've got more people working harder than ever, spending more than ever which looks great, you know, everyone's spending more. Everyone says, oh yeah, we, you know. But if you're not actually benefiting from what you're spending, if you're having to spend the money on childcare costs, on commuting costs, you know, and so forth, uh, just, you know, costs that people didn't in the past used to have to pay, because, you know, you could walk to work and, you know, one member of the family remained, was able to, to stay at home and be a permanent homemaker, then you're not actually, much, you're not actually any better off. You know, everyone's under, and everyone's under such enormous pressures nowadays, you know. I am conscious that, let say, my four nephews and nieces are facing difficult times. They're just going to find themselves having to work, you know, um, very hard just to, to keep, just to keep a roof over them, just to get a roof over them, just to keep a roof over their head. People are getting poorer in real terms. It's because prices are always going up because all this new funny money is being pumped into the system by the banks and they're creating it all as debt. So at the same time as prices are going up and things are getting more expensive, we're getting further and further into debt and you know, our, our wealth and the return that we get from actually working is getting less and less all the time. When you can't deal with poverty when you have a financial system and a money system that distributes money from the poor to the very rich. Any distribution that you try and do in the opposite direction is, um, you know, it's effectively pissing in the wind. If you look at issues like, you know, increasing inequality, one obvious way to tackle inequality is to have, say, for example, a redistributive tax system. You know, you tax the rich, you give some money to the poor, you move a bit of money down, down the scale. Um, that's all very well, but if you completely overlook the fact that there's another redistributive system which is taking money from the poor and giving it to the rich, then you're not really going to tackle this inequality. And um, the way a debt-based money system works, it guarantees that for every pound of money, there's going to be a pound of debt. Now that debt is typically going to end up with you know, the poor, uh, the sort of lower middle classes. Those people end up with the debt and they end up paying interest on that money, which then goes back to the banking sector and gets distributed to the people working in the city or in Wall Street. Um, and what this, what this system does overall is it distributes money from, from the poor to the rich, essentially. Distributes money from you know, the poorer regions of the UK back to the city of London. And it, it also distributes money from all the small businesses, you know, all the little factories um, around the UK and distributes that money back into the financial sector. We have a system whereby the activity of actually supplying occurs under the very same roof as the same organisation that's responsible for profiting from putting together borrowers and lenders, i.e. a bank. So a bank creates our nation's money supply as well as um, making loans uh, for profit. The government cannot allow the banking system to fail because if it did, over 97% of all money would disappear. This is why, in the event of a crisis, the risk is transferred to the taxpayer. But even during normal times, banks receive numerous guarantees and benefits beyond the right to create money. Bill, by the way, I know the Bank of America is a very big bank. It happens I've got $32 there myself. <laughs> now, just between us, what assurance do I have that this money is safe? Well, uh, all deposits up to $10,000 are assured or insured by the federal government in Washington. That's my guarantee. Yeah? Yes. Uh -huh. Have you heard that the federal government is about $280 billion in the hole? <laughs> Banks receive large safety nets from the government. 
the taxpayer guarantees £85,000 as deposit insurance and the Bank of England provides liquidity insurance in case a bank runs out of reserve currency. Someone wrote that a big investment bank is like a giant vampire squid wrapped around the face of humanity, hypnotizing politicians who throw money at the banks, no strings attached, no matter what damage is done, trashing the planet, forcing cuts to things that make life better. Goodbye schools, goodbye playgrounds, goodbye jobs. The bankers that we bailed out then gave themselves bonuses that were bigger than the first wave of public spending cuts. Britain alone gave the banks more money than it cost to put a man on the moon. Six times over. Where did our money go? Who let the banks get away with it? Why? Can vampire squids ever be useful? No government yet is brave enough to tame them. Perhaps they need a plan. The Spending Cuts Agenda is an attempt by the government to shift debt from its account to that of the public. This is the government's response to the bank bailouts and is necessary in a debt-based monetary system where increased purchasing power is the result of growing debt and where a diversification of debt provides overall stability and market confidence. Policies such as student fee increases and the privatisation of public services, assets and industry follow the same model. The problem we're facing, I think, is that uh, there's, been, there's this transference from the, the public debt to, to the private debt, which is, a, which is essentially a, a way of transferring risk, actually, away from sort of UK PLC and the government onto the, the heads of individuals. And it's going to be the most vulnerable individuals who are going to have the most debt. Uh, thus, it's a very unprogressive, regressive uh, policy framework that, that the government's embarking on, where the risk is moved onto those who are most vulnerable. And if there is another financial shock, if there's an oil shock, for example, the people who will pay the penalty are those are the poorest people in society. Or homeowners, for example, who will fall into negative equity if interest rates go up even one or two percent, uh, there'll be real, really big problems. So I don't think it's a, a sensible way forward at the moment at all. And it's, uh, it's regressive and it's certainly not fair uh, in the terms that um, that the government's talking about and it's certainly not a case of we're in this together. As more of a country's resources and industries are privatised, the private sector takes on more debt. As a result, more money is created and there is a boom. Some private equity companies have taken this theory to the extreme, engaging in a practice known as a leveraged buyout, where a company is purchased at an often inflated price and the purchase price is transferred to the business as a debt. The company becomes responsible for the funding of its own purchase. These debts are often so great that the company needs to reduce staff, salaries and research activities. When you have to factor interest as a business, if you have to factor interest repayment into your goods and services, then you have to charge a perpetually higher price as you take on more and more debt. An increase in the diversification of debt results in an increase in the money supply. When the money supply increases, more money is available for productive activities and consumption, which is the condition for a boom. It's questionable whether we're going to get out of this recession or whether we'll just keep ticking along the way that we are now. Um, however, if we do, then when we come out of this recession, when growth starts again, Look at what happens to debt, it will rise and it will keep rising and the faster the economy is growing the faster the debt will rise and then give it another three to five years, we'll be back where we were, you know, the debt will become too much, people will start defaulting again. 
Um, it's kind of the system that we're locked into now is we can't, we can't grow the economy without growing the debt and the debt is the very thing that will bring down the economy. The only option going forwards is to reform it, to stop banks from creating money as debt. By fixing the monetary system we can prevent the banks from ever causing another financial crisis and we can also make the, the current you know, public service cuts and the tax rises and the increase in national debt unnecessary. The current monetary system allows the banking sector to extract wealth from the economy whilst providing nothing productive in return. I mean, why is it that we've got all this technology, um, you know, all this new efficiency, and yet it now requires two people to finance a household, whereas in the 50s it only needed one person working? And the reason for that is not because, you know, these washing machines and everything are more expensive, it's because of all the debt. And it's because, you know, effectively the banking sector is creaming it off from everybody else. So a growing banking sector isn't a sign, you know, it's not a good thing. If the banking sector is growing, it's either that it's becoming less efficient or it's becoming a parasite on the rest of the economy. And that's, you know, we can talk about the banking sector becoming 4%, 5%, 6% of GDP. What's happening to the rest of the economy? It's becoming 96, 95, 94% of GDP. We've got to get switched on to this now. You know, if we want to if we want to have a chance of tackling any of the other big social issues, you've got to figure out the money issue. The poorest in the world pay for crises, even when they've not benefited from the, um, the, the often rec reckless and speculative booms, like the housing boom in, in, in Ireland that, that preceded um, that crisis. You know, over the last 30 years we've seen um, income differentials increase so that the rich have got much, much richer. Um, and ordinary people haven't. They've stayed the same or they've, they've got poorer. Uh, and one of the ways that the economy was kept going was by providing cheap credit, was by providing debt to those very people who couldn't really afford things anymore. Um, so they kept buying. Um, and when it collapses, it's those same people that, that have to pay once again, uh, even though in, in many ways they were the victims the first time around. As a result of the crises, the Bank of England has bought corporate debt and repackaged it at lower rates of interest. Yet the average person is being asked to pay more than ever to borrow on overdrafts and credit cards. Debts between the very wealthy um, or between governments can always be renegotiated and always have been throughout world history. They're not anything set in stone. It's generally speaking when you have debts owed by the poor to the rich that suddenly debts become a sacred obligation more important than anything else. Um, the idea of renegotiating them becomes unthinkable. Can you pin down exactly what would keep investors happy, make them feel more confident? Uh, that's a tough one. Um, personally, uh, it doesn't matter. That, that's it. See, I'm a trader. Uh, I don't really care about that kind of stuff. Were you born in if I see an opportunity to make money, I go with that. Um, so, for most traders, we don't really care that much how they're going to fix the how they're going to fix the economy, how they're going to fix the uh, the whole situation. Our job is to make money from it. And personally, I've been dreaming of this moment for three years. If you know what to do, you can make a lot of money from this. Uh, I I had a confession, which is, uh, I go to bed every night, I dream of another recession, I dream of another moment like this. I dream of another recession. I dream of another moment like this. You can make a lot of money from this. Bruno, Virginia hurt somebody real bad. You ought to hate her. The way in which you can look across Europe now and see that the new Prime Minister of Greece, not elected, essentially imposed, Papadimos, former employee of uh, Goldman Sachs, the new Prime Minister and Finance Minister of Italy, Mario Monti, former employee of Goldman Sachs, the new President of the European Central Bank, former employee of Goldman Sachs. It's quite, you know, you kind of see these people popping up absolutely everywhere. That's the way to change what we have. Take all power and all freedoms away from the people and collect everything into the hands of one small group with absolute power from the people, without the people, against the people. What's been interesting out of all this, I suppose, is the question of democracy that's been opened up very starkly in Europe, that, that you have a government of bankers essentially imposed on you. 
bankers who more or less got us into this mess, to put it rather crudely, but that's a good first approximation to it. And then you say, okay, bankers are the people who are therefore going to get us out of it, and incidentally they're going to run your, your country now. It, there's, there's a serious question of democracy that's opened up here. By the way, the banking crisis drove more than 100 million people back into poverty. The mortality statistics of people who go into poverty rise hugely for a whole range of reasons. So the banking crisis isn't just about becoming poorer, it was about killing people as well. And guess what? We haven't really got to the bottom of it. We never held anybody to account and we haven't done the radical reforming job that we really needed to do because we mistakenly thought if we destabilise the position any further, it'll make matters worse. And guess who took the decisions? All the people who were there in the first place. I think you ought to know that the business of one of these businessmen is murder. Their weapons are modern. They are thinking 2,000 years out of date. Look, I was there when the secretary and the uh, chairman of the Federal Reserve came those days and talked with members of Congress about what was going on. It was about September 15th. Here's the facts, and we don't even need to talk about these things. On Thursday at about 11 o'clock in the morning, the Federal Reserve noticed a tremendous drawdown of uh, 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 money market accounts in the United States to the tune of $550 billion was being dr drawn out in a matter of an hour or two. The Treasury opened up its uh, 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 window to help. They pumped $105 billion in the system and quickly realized that they could not stem the tide. We were having an electronic run on the banks. They decided to close the operation, close down the money accounts, and announce a guarantee of $250,000 per account so there wouldn't be further panic out there. And that's what actually happened. If they had not done that, th their estimation was that by 2 o'clock that afternoon, five and a half trillion dollars would have been drawn out of the money market system of the United States, would have collapsed the entire economy of the United States, and within 24 hours the world economy would have collapsed. When money is withdrawn internationally from one currency to another, the reserve currency shifts from the national bank of one country to the reserve account of the foreign bank. Foreign banks have relationships with local banks that allow them to hold foreign reserve currencies whilst not being a part of the central bank scheme at the local central bank. For example, when £1,000 is transferred into euros, a UK bank will agree an exchange rate with a euro area bank, perhaps 1.15 euros to the pound. The UK bank will then transfer £1,000 of the central reserve currency to the UK partner bank of the European bank, whilst the European bank will transfer €1,150 of reserve currency to the European partner bank of the UK bank. What happens when currencies and the exchange rate system is no longer managed? What are some of the first consequences? Devaluations, speculation imbalances where some countries would accrue more and more and more what what would they accrue other currencies other currencies the reserve currency needs to be spent in the country of origin or exchanged into other currencies most foreign banks do not have deposit taking accounts outside of their national borders and as such the foreign reserves they hold do not come back to them in the form of deposits. When a country accumulates trade imbalances, it either accumulates foreign reserve currencies, in the case of surplus, or spends its own reserves, in the case of negative trade balances. Balance of trade is, is basically uh, the 
difference between what you're selling abroad and what you're buying from abroad. Now, the feature on the, the UK is that for a very long period of time, it's had a deficit on something called the visible balance of trade, which is trade in things, well, things that you can see. So that is goods that you'd recognize, stuff you can put in containers, it's cars, computers, things that you'd see in a shop. That's been in substantial deficit for, I think it opened up in, in the, uh, it did open up in the early 1980s. Uh, and essentially it hasn't, it hasn't gone away since, and if anything has got wider and wider. Foreign exchange reserves cannot be directly used for domestic spending. The money can only be spent abroad or on imports. A country with a large balance of trade deficit relies on its creditors to spend the imbalances accrued in its own market. I mean, there, there have been proposals in the past to try and create a mechanism uh, for those imbalances to, to match up. So Keynes, for instance, John Maynard Keynes, uh, at the end of the Second World War, his original proposal for what became Bretton Woods and the set of institutions set up there, like the IMF and the World Bank, was that there would be a kind of international clearing union. Uh, this is particularly relating to, to the trade side rather than the, the sort of the financial side directly. But the principle was that, you know, once trade balances had opened up, everybody would bank through an international clearing bank uh, and that would kind of force everyone to, to eventually reconcile uh, the imbalances that appeared in the real economy. But no such mechanism exists. The accumulated net trade imbalance for the UK is around £800 billion. In essence, what has happened is that over many years, some countries have had big trade surpluses and others big trade deficits. The countries with trade deficits have been spending more than they've been earning, so they've had to borrow from abroad. And they've been doing this year after year. Countries like that are the United States, ourselves, and some other countries in Europe. That cannot go on. And there are two ways in which this can come to an end. Either, and we're seeing this in some other countries in Europe, if they can't find new ways to become competitive, then their ability to repay the debts is called into question. Another way of doing it, which we followed, is that we got a credible plan to repay our debts, and the value of sterling has fallen by 25% to make our exports more competitive and attractive to overseas buyers, and it to be more attractive for British consumers to buy from British producers rather than overseas producers. That is what we have done to put in place a framework to rebalance our economy, and I'm sure that's the right way to do it. Currency war, also known as competitive devaluation, is a condition where countries compete against each other to achieve a relatively low exchange rate for their currency. As the price to buy a particular currency falls, so too does the real price of exports from that country. Domestic industry receives a boost in demand, both at home and abroad. It's made British exports appear rather cheaper, so they've kind of recovered a little bit, but because the rest of the world is now looking really quite ropey, they've started to fall back down again. So what we're looking at is something that, that almost a kind of anarchy, and in a way, the increasing anarchy. This is what's happened over the last few years, where you know, the Brazilian finance minister has been most vocal about this, uh, talking about currency wars, talking about the desire of national governments when confronted by a major recession, they think if we could export more, we could dig ourselves out of this recession. If we want to export more, we depreciate our currency. That makes our goods cheaper, everyone else buys them, we'll all be better off. Now, the issue here is that if you depreciate, it's like everybody else appreciates against you. Their stuff becomes more expensive, so they're not too happy about that. They also want to depreciate. And this is where you can see a competitive round of devaluations breaking out. To decrease the value of its national currency, a national central bank sells reserve currency into the market. It creates this currency out of nothing by typing numbers into a computer. During the long phase of commodity money, the exchange rate would depend on the amount of gold, silver, or copper contained in the coins of each country. Similarly, after the advent of paper money and the gold standard, 
The exchange rate depended on the amount of gold the government promised to pay the holder of the banknotes. These amounts did not vary greatly in the short term, and as such, exchange rates between currencies were relatively stable. After the Second World War, currencies were pegged to the dollar, and the dollar was backed by gold. This system came to an end in 1971. So, we have a modern financial system where money is now chaotically organised. There is no exchange rate because there's no gold standard system to sustain. So we don't need it. In fact, we believe the market will resolve all of the problems of exchange. Whether your currency should be worth more than mine is a reflection of your economy relative to mine. And if that changes, the currency and the exchange rate can change. And if we need that to happen, it'll happen magically by the efficiency of market and profit seeking and you guys know the rest, I think. A currency's value in relation to another currency is determined by the market. If more people want to buy a currency than sell it, its value increases. If more people want to sell, its value decreases. The value is set by individual banks. As they buy and sell currencies, they will adjust the exchange rate. In the last study I read in 2007, each day on currency markets, 3.2 trillion dollars are traded each day. Who knows what the global GDP is? 50. Again, Brucey, higher. 60, that's closer. The point is, think about that exchange happening every single day. There's about 260 business days a year. It takes a few weeks to match the global value of every economic transaction that happens everywhere, every day, in a year. And it takes a few weeks. Obviously all of us trade currency fairly, fairly regularly. If you go abroad, you exchange into another currency. That's a form of currency trading. You're, you're swapping your pounds into whatever, euros or you know, yen or whatever it might be. That happens fairly regularly and that's a conventional part of the trading process. And large corporations have to do this on a regular basis. Where it becomes something that people question and where you get people saying, well, hang on, this is speculation, is when you get people realising that currencies move around next to each other. And if they move around in value next to each other, there's always an opportunity to try and make money out of those changes in value. And therefore, you can speculate on it. And that's, that's the more sort of questionable end of the market. That's the bit of the market that things like a financial transactions tax would try and chop away at. Because the, the assumption there, and it's, it's kind of not incorrect, is that this just produces instability for everyone else. That these people want volatility in the market because that's how they make their money. They want to encourage it and they do encourage it by uh, trading and speculating in the way that they do. By 2010, the foreign exchange market had grown to be the largest and most liquid market in the world, with an average of $4 trillion of currency being exchanged every day. Volatility creates a need. What does it do to countries especially perhaps small ones like developing countries, if there are suddenly huge and instantly fluctuating financial flows, what do they have to do to cope? Increase their production and sell more. Lowering the price. And becoming possibly even poorer. Once you start talking about the international system, it becomes really quite a peculiar uh, quite peculiar thing in that a lot of it depends on simply sentiment and beliefs about what an economy is like rather more than it depends on anything the economy might or might not actually be doing and that can shift very very rapidly because you know if, it, if it's just somebody's belief about currency is supportable uh, then you know they can carry on believing this until well till whenever if that belief changes it can change very rapidly in a financial market the process of financial contagion can, can take place you know in just minutes, seconds even, that you can just move from being apparently quite a stable, robust economy to being one that suddenly sentiment has turned against you and you find that markets are picking on you. And it can often be not much more than you're simply a next door neighbour of uh, you know, a country that's currently in trouble. Many of the world's financial crises in the past 30 years have been caused by rapid withdrawals of the nation's currency or the currencies of an entire region. This type of activity is often referred to as financial warfare. 
it's benefited uh, major institutions really quite substantially. That Goldman Sachs, you know, for example, or any large bank has done somewhat better out of this set of arrangements than it would have done in a far more regulated environment. It's made people very, very wealthy. It's allowed financial markets to expand absolutely enormously. Anybody involved in that is keen on seeing a deregulated world. In the case of the UK, you have a government which has been quite overtly and deliberately and aggressively arguing against any forms of regulation being imposed on those financial markets. But it's not the case that someone's behind the scenes pulling the strings. It's, it's that this is, this is how the thing works quite deliberately, quite, you know, overtly in front of you. That's the world as it is. It's making some people very rich. They're quite happy with it. I think it is a form of economic warfare. Um, much of the, the change in the, in the way that the global economy works over the last 30 years result from this, this debt, this third world debt, because it's given rich countries and banks and the financial sector enormous amounts of power and control over the poorer bits of the world where a lot of the resources are that we like using. And um, that's been used in a way that many people have compared to a form of colonialism. I mean, it's a very real, direct form of, of power that's been used over those countries to force those countries to do what are really in the interests of the richest segments of the world that they do. And as a result of that, um, not only have corporations become absolutely, uh, in very, you know, made huge amounts of profits and become absolutely enormous and, and, um, and all pervasive, um, but the financial sector has become even bigger than that. And the, and, and the real money in, in the world uh, to be made today is not by producing anything at all, it's simply by forms of speculating, basically making money from money. Uh, that's the most profitable and, and by far in a way um, the, the biggest form of, of, of activity, of economic activity that exists in the world today. To protect themselves, vulnerable countries need to accrue currency from rich countries who create these currencies out of nothing. The Netherlands first governor general of Indonesia, the man who built the trade routes, fortified them what I mean by that is built forts along them and fought Spanish fleets and British fleets. Said about the development of the, Spa of the, of the Netherlands Empire and Netherlands trade was, we cannot make trade without war, nor war without trade. Money and power. So reserves have become the way in which you can insure yourself against what? Speculation. Who, you said speculation. Speculative attack. Fall in the market. Bubbles. When a country succumbs to a speculative attack, it is asked to deregulate its markets and conform its financial system to that of the dominant party. The big problem that's faced by most developing countries who got into a debt crisis uh, was that they were told by the powers that be in the world, the International Monetary Fund, um, which is in, in many ways governs the, the, the global financial system, that the way to get out of debt actually is first of all to, to um, restructure your economy, especially to increase your exports so you're earning more, more um, dollars and then you can pay off your, your debt which is normally in dollars or some other uh, foreign currency. Um, unfortunately, time and time again that was proved to to not be the case at all. Actually countries cut back their public spending to the bone so they stopped growing, they stopped having any potential um, for growth um, and what they did produce was, was, um, was aimed at the export market, was aimed at creating dollars and so on. So they were paying off their debts but they weren't uh, developing their own economy at all. They were paying far, far, far more in debt repayments than they were spending on health or education or anything else and their debts just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. The country becomes a vassal state allowing large corporations to exploit its natural resources and workforce. It's not, it's not even shadowy. You see, there's no great mystery about, about what, what's happening here and about the way the world operates. It's, like, it's, it's quite blunt. I mean, for, for the last 30 years, you've got something pretty much everywhere. Well, it certainly spreads pretty much everywhere. That generally gets labelled neoliberalism. This idea that you should have floating exchange rates, you know, weak regulation, particularly financial markets, minimal government 
interference or involvement with what market does and that's that's more or less how the world operates and then there are institutions and the outstanding one at this point is the IMF that, that will actively try and enforce this state of affairs so it's, it's not greatly shadowy if you see what I mean that, that there are people behind the scenes somewhere trying to manipulate stuff it's actually this is quite this is quite overt this this is happening and this is how uh, for well, entire, my entire adult life actually is what it starts to look like this is how the world the world has operated and it's made some people very very wealthy it's produced enormous concentrations of wealth. So when the International Monetary Fund comes in in order to try and uh, alleviate a country's um, debt problems, it, it imposes a set of conditions. And in the 1980s and 90s, they call that set of conditions structural adjustment, structural adjustment program. And it tends to take very similar forms wherever it happens. And indeed, we can see structural adjustment programs, in essence, happening today in countries like Greece and Portugal and Ireland, um, where countries are instructed to uh, decrease the amount that they spend on the public sector. Um, they are instructed to liberalise their, their uh, trade market and liberalise their um, capital market so money can much more easily come in and out of their economy. And the idea is that this will encourage investment to come in from richer parts of the world and that all of their problems will be solved from this investment. And in actual fact this has proved um, time and time again to be um, uh, completely without foundation. In actual fact what happens is it destroys fledgling industries and capacities in these developing countries and developing countries become completely dependent on goods and services from developed countries and also from capital from developed countries. Uh, one of the things the International Monetary Fund is very, is very um, keen on is um, telling countries to lower the taxes um, that should be paid by multinational corporations when they come and operate in a country because then you'll encourage more multinational corporations to come in. Of course what it also means is the profits that are made by those multinational corporations leave the country just as quickly and the country itself doesn't benefit. And today you have many developing countries which have got um, almost no tax base. Um, they've not developed a tax base at all and so they're even more dependent on international capital markets, on the money markets, on creating debt. Um, and that's why you have so many countries in the world that have really been robbed of their sovereignty. It's very difficult to see how democratic societies can evolve or function when actually a government is more dependent on the diktats of the International Monetary Fund and the money markets than it is on their own people. What we've seen since the 1970s is a dramatic increase in a series of phenomena that have had a, a stimulative effect on the changes in the financial system that have brought us to the gleaming, shining metal and steel business that's over there. In case you don't know, that's the city of London I'm putting it. To compensate for the lack of a defined commodity-based value underlying currencies, financial institutions developed securitization as a means to manage risk. You know, you develop securitization as a means to try and stabilize the whole system. This is a set of financial processes and financial innovations that really accelerate from the 70s, 80s onwards. You had a chaotic system that needed to manage risk and you had to innovate. You needed derivatives, options, futures. You have new markets in volatility management tools. Who knows what the term hedging is? Spreading your risk, managing your risk, insuring against your risk, precisely. Up until very recently, you know, it's up until the 1960s, the Securities and Exchange Commission would be quite clear that you know, derivatives that weren't based on real products, like agricultural products, so pork belly futures or whatever, would in fact be essentially kind of gambling, and therefore you weren't allowed to trade them. That, that changes in the 60s, and everybody can trade, you know, uh, currency futures, you know, things that are not based on real products, being traded at some point in the future, but are based on movements of, of currency prices. Once you have the system of fixed exchange rates breaks down, obviously this thing accelerates enormously. So as you get the rollback of government regulation here, you get the market taking over with its own products here. And the theory is that the market is better at regulating itself, it's more stable than if you have a government interfering all the time. The efficient markets hypothesis, the idea that you know you set up a financial market, they're fast, everybody in them is well informed, they all keep a very careful eye on what everyone else is doing, it will therefore uh, be very stable and it reflect real changes in the economy. It's not going to be driven by you know, panics and manias and speculative bubbles, none of this is really going to happen. If, if you, there is movement up and down, it's because something real is happening and in traders and investors in the financial market are responding to it. So that's the efficient markets hypothesis. The practice 
And I think what you see in 2008 is the kind of end of that process. The appearance of this crisis so major, the, the belief that it will simply be self-stabilizing, self-regulating, really can't carry on. I mean, the practice carries on anyway, but you can't really argue in the same way that you used to, that it's good or it's necessary or this is okay for the world. In the last decade, we had a new innovation, something called the credit default swap, a way of buying insurance against the company you've invested in going bust. And in 2002, they were less worth, in total, less than a trillion dollars. In 2007, they were worth 60 trillion dollars. That's five years. Everybody's suddenly sitting there and thinking, oh, these CDOs we've made uh, don't in fact provide the kind of stability that we thought. The maths that's inside of them is, is complete nonsense, it turns out. Uh, there's far more risk attached to um, trying to securitize risk and securitize debt in the way that we have done this than we thought, and we think these things are now worthless. The attempt to get more and more complex ways of regulating and shaping a financial market and trying to make a, a quick book out of it as well actually helped produce the, uh, the opposite effect to what its kind of apologist said, which is that it led to, led to a spectacular crash. What we saw as a result of this very different situation was one phenomenon above all, one sector above all grew, and that was the financial sector. While the financial sector benefits enormously from the current monetary system, the system is neither stable nor fair. The assumption in what the Bank of England does right now is that the cash that we hold is backed up by government debt. The government can back up its promises by the fact that it can tax the public. So what they're implying is that cash is backed up by government debt when get government debt is backed up by the ability of government to get cash from the public. Time and time again over the last 30 years we've seen uh, private debts being transformed into, into public debts and um, the, ultimately the price of that debt is paid by, uh, by the public in the, in the debtor country. This is why spending cuts are necessary. The system is designed to make certain people very rich at the expense of a nation's citizens and taxpayers. The system lowers the standard of living of the majority and distributes this wealth among the privileged. So what we're left with is a financial system since the early 70s that has no fixed exchange rates, that suddenly has increasingly open financial borders, that has central banks having to manage without having any control because there's nothing here where the gold used to be, chaotically. They have to ease quantitatively. They have to lend as a lender of last resort. Throughout history, monetary systems were designed to give the dominant international power an advantage. And this power is fiercely defended and expanded on. What I would like to see is um, a, a new kind of currency that is backed by uh, something that, that is scarce and that we really need and we really value, something like energy or renewable energy, for example. So a, a sort of kilowatt hour backed currency would be, would be very interesting to me. We need to start valuing the things that are most scarce um, and, uh, and that we need to survive as a human race in the long run and backing an international currency with something like that will generate enormous investment in, for example, renewable energy. If that's the, you know, the primary international um, unit of account that's, that's, that's being used. Uh, another option is, is a basket of, of currencies, so you, you, know, you, you mix up the value of, of, of different currencies um, to, to create a very solid currency that people have confidence in. Perhaps even better would be a basket of commodities with which to back up international currencies. Now if it was possible 
internationally some way or another to get all these competing and increasingly competing national economies together and say uh, we're all going to sit down and write out an agreement somewhat like the Bretton Woods agreement which will allow for unlike Bretton Woods allow for you know some currencies to, to be pegged against different baskets of goods that are more appropriate to, to their national economies and you can sort of arrange this if you could arrange that to happen then that would be nice and you can see how that would start to create a kind of order in the international macroeconomy, which is otherwise lacking. The, the real difficulty there is just political. It's like, who on earth is going to do this? Who, who is the force that, that's going to kind of make this thing happen? Creating a monetary system which is both fair and stable is possible and can be achieved. What are international organisations for, if not for such a purpose? This is George. George worked in a big bank in the city of London. But one day, without warning, George's bank went bust. Luckily, the government rescued the bank and George kept his job. But the greedy government wanted something in return for their help. They demanded a higher tax on George's salary and bonus. For someone with a high-cost lifestyle like George, a shock like this can be devastating. Now George struggles to afford the rent on his Riverside apartment in central London. The tyres on his Aston Martin are wearing thin and are barely road legal. Unless George's situation improves, or unless someone like you helps him, then George may even be forced to walk past the next Savile Row tailors and buy his suit from Topshop or Next. Even if George had anything to celebrate, he can no longer afford the champagne to celebrate with. George is not alone. Countless others are suffering like him, and no one knows how long it'll be until the good times return. But with your help, George can turn his life around. A simple monthly donation from you can bring a bit of sunshine back to George's life. Just £395 will help him celebrate minor achievements with a magnum of Cristal Champagne. As little as £900 will help George buy a new set of tyres for his Aston Martin. £2,000 can help George recover his self-esteem with a suit from a prestigious Savile Row tailor. But even a small amount will help. Just £200 will buy a meal for George and his girlfriend experience. Just £200 extra will buy the drinks. By adopting a banker, you won't just be supporting someone like George in a time of need. You'll also be supporting the trendy wine bars of the City of London, the luxury car makers of Italy and the tailors of Savile Row. You'll be doing your patriotic duty to support Britain's greatest industry in its time of need. And when the good times return and George gets his bonus back, the taxes he pays will help fund the public services that the rest of you scroungers depend on. So please, until the good times return for George and those like him, will you give today?